Hello everyone, today I will be showing you how to use the docking feature of Interactive Rosetta. This protocol will allow you to take two sets of protein chains and predict a binding interface for them. The first thing you need to do is open the structures of all the chains that you wish to dock in Rosetta. For this exercise, I will be using an antibody antigen complex. First we have to get the structures. I have a copy of both the antibody and the antigen saved on my computer, so let's load them. Now that I have loaded the structures, let's go over to the protocols menu and select docking. This is what the docking panel looks like. There are a lot of controls here and they are all important, so let's go over them one by one. Before I do anything else I have to tell Rosetta which chains will be docked and what groups they are in. The static group is the group of chains that will be fixed and the moving group is the group of chains that will be moved into contact with the static group. You can select chains from these drop down menus, so let's put the antibody chains in the static group and the antigen chain in the moving group. I should point out that it is not necessary at this point for the groups to be in the same model. You can take chains from diverse models and put them into this grid right here. Interactive Rosetta will automatically put them into a single PDB structure before performing docking. Before we do anything else, let me show you something neat that can help Rosetta out a bit. Since this is an antibody docking exercise, I know that the CDR loops are going to be facing the antigen, so there is no need to randomize the orientation of the antibody, only the antigen. But the two structures are so far apart right now. Well you could use superposition to get them on top of each other and then use the manipulation panel with the green soccer ball to move the antigen to the outside of the CDR region. Or you could use this handy dandy little reorient button down here. So let's get a close up of the antibody. If I look at the sequence I would expect CDRH3 to be somewhere over here. So let's select it. There it is in the structure. Now let's quickly select a slice of that CDR region. There, that looks pretty good. Now let's hit reorient. So now the antigen was brought over to face this interface. Basically what it did was calculate the center of the antibody, calculate the center of the selected region, draw a line through those two points, and grab the antigen and stick its center on this line a bit further out from the interface. So you may need to play with the interface selection or do some touching up with the manipulation panel after this. But this technique is useful for getting the structures oriented more properly, which will save Rosetta from doing all kinds of bad searches on the antibody. Okay, the next thing to do is specify constraints. What are constraints? Glad you asked. Constraints are user-defined restrictions on which residues should be interacting. So Rosetta penalizes docked predictions that fail to meet the constraints. This step is very important. If you are doing a protein-protein docking simulation, you need to specify constraints if you are expecting to get a decent model. There are two types of constraints, atom pair and site constraints. Atom pair constraints force two atoms to be within a certain distance. Site constraints tell Rosetta to keep an atom within a certain distance of any atom on another chain. So they are a bit more ambiguous. So let's say I happen to know that these two residues are in contact with each other in the docked structure. Then I come over here and select atom pair and add them to my constraints set. But we are not done yet. When I add the constraint it only is aware of the first residue in the pair, which is in the static chain group, in this case from the antibody. So the partner field is left blank. Since I have the right partner already selected all I have to do is right click in this cell to get the partner to show up. Right clicking will actually fill all the rows underneath with valid residues sequentially following each other so you could fill in a lot at once. I should also point out that when setting up atom pair constraints the first residue always has to be from the static group. So make sure you are attempting to add residues from the static group first and then right click the partners. Let's say I know the set of residues on the light and heavy chains will be interacting with the antigen, but I don't know where on the antigen they interact. So I can specify them as site constraints. Now I have to tell it to partner these residues with the antigen chain V. 
So let's select four residues on the antigen and then right click over here to fill in all four at once. But what if I wanted to go in the other direction? I might know that this residue is on the epitope so it interacts with either the light or heavy chain, but I don't know which chain it interacts with. So let's add it twice and specify one as interacting with a heavy chain and one with a light chain. Now let's take a look at this group column over here. It's okay to leave most of these blank, but since I am unsure whether the light or heavy chain interacts with this antigen residue, I am going to type an ID into the group column that is the same for both of them. Now this tells Rosetta that when performing the docking, it should group these two constraints together and the penalty of the group will be equal to the lowest penalty of either of these two. So if the residue ends up interacting with either of these chains, it will get no penalty and only receive a penalty if it interacts with neither. I should point out that a blank ID will cause Rosetta to treat these constraints separately, so all the other constraints do not end up being in one big group because they all have blank ID values. What if I was kind of uncertain about this constraint? I don't want it to be weighted as much as the other constraints, so let's click on it and change its weight. It defaults to 1 but I could change it to a lower value. Now if this constraint is not satisfied it won't be penalized as much as the others. Be careful because if you set the weight value too high you might end up overpowering the rest of the Rosetta scoring function in favor of the constraints, which will not give you good results. There are also a lot of other advanced options here, unless you know what you are doing I would not change the function type. The min and max values specify the range in angstroms between the two partners in which there is no penalty, otherwise a parabolic penalty is applied outside of this range. You can also change what atoms are constrained in the selected residues, but the default of the C beta or C alpha for glycine should be okay the way they are. Well that was tedious. So we should save a copy of this constraints file in case we need to come back to it later. Then we can load it and skip all of what we just did, as long as the same models are loaded and specified up here. Let me load a constraints file with real constraints. What this ensemble docking all about? Turns out that you can model backbone flexibility during docking by docking ensembles together instead of single structures. So if you want to do this, you will need ensemble representations of the static and moving groups. I will explain how to generate those in the ensemble generation tutorial which is another protocol. We're almost ready to perform docking. The last step is to tell Rosetta whether one or both of the docking partners will start with their orientations randomized. Global means that both partners will be randomized. This means that the static group will not be randomized. This means that the moving group will not be randomized. This means that neither will be randomized. Since we know that the current antibody orientation is near correct but the antigen orientation is unknown, I'll fix the static structure. Even though it is fixed, there will be some minor perturbations on the antibody to wiggle it into place with the antigen, so it is not 100% fixed. I'm going to perform 1000 decoy models and then return the top 10 refined structures. Without the server, you will run docking on your computer and it will perform 1000 core stocks quickly and take the top 10 of these models for high resolution refinement. So let's use the server. Click dock. It gives me a message that the server received my job, gave me an ID, and will let me know when it is done. If I check the download manager over here. I can see my docking job, the server will give me status updates frequently so I can see how far along the job is, anyway, this will take a while so I will see you in a bit with the results. Ok that ended up taking a while, but here's the message telling me my results are completed. So let's download and save the models. So I ended up getting the top 10 models and I also got an ensemble archive file that packages them all as an ensemble. If I need to unpack that archive at a later date, I can do that using the unpack feature in the ensemble generation protocol. Anyway, that's the rundown of what you need to do to perform a doc in interactive Rosetta. See you next time.